So I wanted to talk about uh, a recent uh, press release that NASA put out. Um, a NASA operator telescope called SWIFT, which is actually a gamma ray observatory in space. But they put out a press release on a, an ultraviolet image of the, la of the Magellanic clouds, the large and small clouds of Magellan. So I thought I should tell you what, what they are before we go on, and then talk about why this observation was quite interesting. The name dates back to a, a Portuguese explorer, Magellan, who basically did, did the, well, whose group of ships did the first, first ever circumnavigation of the world. Started in, in Spain and went back to Spain. Unfortunately, Magellan didn't actually make the entire trip himself. He, he, he got halfway around, got to the Philippines, and then unfortunately got killed in a battle in the Philippines, halfway around. These galaxies, the large and small uh, Magellanic clouds, are named after him because he was the first European to potentially go to the Southern Hemisphere and actually look up in the sky. And, a, and a, if you looked up, if you were in, in Chile or in, in Australia, New Zealand or South Africa, and you look up on a clear night, they're kind of best observed. I mean, they're, they're basically you see them year round, but really you see them best in October, November time. They look like kind of clouds. They're kind of quite big. It's not bright because it's basically it's diffuse because it's made up of lots of very faint stars and gas. Um, but it's it's big. It's about you know, 10 degrees across. And actually, it's a, it's a it's often talked about as a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. So you might think of a satellite galaxy like the LMC as one that basically just goes round and round the Milky Way like this. In fact, it's a bit more like a, a, bit more like a comet almost, its orbit. Where it actually, we think in the past it was kind of way out there, both, both clouds together, and right now they're, they're in this very, clo very close uh, location relative to the, to the Milky Way. And again, we think in the past, in the future, they're going to go out, way out again. So quite an eccentric orbit. It just happened to be where right now is actually where they're really close. And so actually the Milky Way itself is something like 100,000 light years across. And, and the light from, from the LMC, it takes about 180,000 years to get to us. So actually, it's, they're actually pretty, if the Milky Way is so big, the LMC is probably like so far away. So actually it's quite close right now on this very eccentric orbit. So both the small and the large clouds of Magellan are things which can only be seen in the Southern Hemisphere. So they're quite negative declinations, so they're quite low down. So they're, if, you're, if you're in the kind of southernest part of Chile, they kind of go, circum they kind of go straight above the head at certain times of the year. But really they're, they're not seen even from uh, equatorial regions of Earth. To look at them, Paul, they look, they're, they're quite near each other. Are, the two, are they related? Are they, are they gravitationally bound? Yeah, well, we don't really know, but we, we certainly this, we, we think so. I mean, we certainly think that they're, they're, there's, actually a, there's actually what's called a magical extreme, and so there's actually stars and gas kind of streaming between the two. So there is some, some connection between the two. They're quite distinct. The LNC is the more massive one, the bigger one. Um, but we think really that these things are kind of connected and actually are in a kind of common orbit. So maybe they're in orbit around themselves and then they, they, they come in towards the Milky Way right now and they will together go out uh, at, to, to larger distances again in the future. When we look at Andromeda, which sometimes we think of as kind of looking in the mirror at yeah. a nearby galaxy that That's looks right. like us, we see companions to Andromeda. We do, yeah. So of the, the biggest companion to Andromeda is M33, which is another kind of spiral. It's a medium-sized spiral. Um, but we also have other, other companions. There's probably each, both the Milky Way and the Andromeda have got a couple of dozen satellite galaxies. And so I'd say probably the LMC is kind of closest to M33. It's a bit smaller, but it's a bit like that. And, and the SMC is probably closer to some of the more dwarf galaxies orbiting uh, Andromeda Galaxy. These are very popular targets. These are, these are basically our nearest big, big medium-sized galaxies to, uh, external to our Milky Way. And what's different about them, actually, is the fact that the... The, the gas in these two galaxies, it, it's not pristine, but it's a, bit, it's a bit less rich in the, in the elements like oxygen and iron than the, the Milky Way is. So, it's, uh, so they're not only very close to us, and so we can actually see individual stars in the two galaxies, but also the fact that the, the composition of the gas from which the stars are being formed is a bit lower, I mean, the Milky, the, the lower than the Milky Way. So actually they're, they're a little bit different. So yeah, there are sort of differences between, for example, Cepheid, these variable stars which are used as distance indicators between the Cepheid, galaxy, Cepheid stars, pulsation stars in the Milky Way, in the LMC and in the small Magellanic Cloud. Is it known or is it likely that these galaxies were formed at the same time as the Milky Way, kind of in the way that planets form around the Sun or are they more likely to have drifted past and got captured? 
I, th I, my, my, I, I suspect that what happened is that they probably have been kind of captured, really, that they, they, the, the oldest stars in these, in these galaxies are pretty old, on a par with maybe the oldest, oldest stars in the Milky Way. And what we think is the Milky Way actually has been built up of assimilating, kind of grabbing little galaxies along the time. As it gets more massive, it gets more of these dwarf galaxies uh, kind of building up. And actually, we think maybe at some point in the future, it's likely that, that the clouds will get captured by the Milky Way. And again, that the stars will then actually end up becoming part of the Milky Way at some point in the future. So we're in the middle of capturing these guys? Well, it's, I think it's a slow process. If, if they were really on tight orbits, we'd be collecting them soon. In fact, there are other galaxies which are right in the process of merging with the Milky Way. It's, at some point in the future, maybe actually well after the point at which Milky Way and Andromeda merge, we'll probably end up with these things being kind of in, in the mix. They'll go we'll into the mix of the Milky Way and Andromeda. A lot of people have seen an optical view of the, of the large magnetic cloud. This is the, the bar of old stars in it. This is a region called Tarantula Nebula, the region where newborn stars, the biggest star forming factory there is in the local group of galaxies. But this is a view of optical wavelengths. And so the sun, this is kind of close to where the sun's energy peaks. But what's new is that, is that the, there has been a recent composite image of the LMC in the ultraviolet. So this is now wavelengths uh, a high energy wavelengths by a, by a factor of three compared to optical light. It looks like, uh, it looks like Europe from space. It does, doesn't it? Can you can see like the cities or uh, the light from the cities. So, so here we're looking at basically mostly the old, old stars really in the gas, which has been ionized by young stars at optical wavelengths. But in the ultraviolet, at shorter, shorter wavelengths or, or higher energies, we're looking at things which are hot, much hotter than the sun. So all the points of light here are really hot, hot stars, stars for which um, their, their temperatures are rather than 6,000 degrees, which is typical of the sun, 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 degrees, they're much, much hotter stars. And, and because they're hotter, their energy is coming out at, at shorter wavelengths or higher energies, and so their characteristic energy output is much, much more impressive in the uh, ultraviolet wavelengths. And so to actually see things in the ultraviolet wavelengths, we have to go, into, we have to go above the atmosphere, the protective uh, blanket of the atmosphere of the Earth. This isn't the first ever view of the large magnetic cloud taken from, from, uh, from above the atmosphere. The first ever time, actually, that was done was from the Apollo missions. So Apollo 16, uh, that's the penultimate Apollo mission to the moon, they, as well as taking their moon buggy, they also took a telescope. And they took a telescope called the Far UV, Far Ultraviolet uh, Camera and Spectrograph. It's only a little tiny telescope, uh, about seven and a half centimeters diameter, a three inch telescope. And they put it, they mounted it on a tripod and they used 35 millimeter film. It was an era before digital cameras came along. And they put it in the shadow of the lunar uh, lander, it's basically to avoid the kind of direct sunlight. And it took lots of images of things, in, things including the sun itself and lots of stars and nebulae, but also it took the first ever view of the LMC. The difference between the Swift view, built up of thousands of digi digital images from orbit, and the ones from the Apollo 16 telescope, is that the Apollo in the 1972 had a, it was a very, very short exposure uh, with photographic film, and so very, very rudimentary view. Okay. Go flight. Crew was asking how the old heart rate was looking. Houston, uh, the Earth is uh, yeah, maybe... The uh, uh, looks good. We've got good... The Earth is, right, is uh, maybe a quarter. It's right in the middle. Uh, what uh, Swift has done now is allowed us to look at a, a factor of nearly 100 times higher spatial resolution. So it's not... It's, not, it's gone from really low, low, low resolution view of the LMC in the ultraviolet from the surface of the moon to actually a sort of super high resolution view from orbit uh, with Swift. What a ride, what a ride. 